The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us for another Concrete Ontario webinar. Uh, my name is Alan Carey, and I'm the Director of Technical Services at Concrete Ontario, and I will be facilitating the session this morning. Now, to say that the last few months have been challenging, not only for our industry, but many others is uh, quite an understatement, as we all deal with the ramifications of uh, COVID-19. Um, so before we do get started, I will turn it over to uh, Bart Cantors, President of Concrete Ontario, just to say a few words about the industry um, and the association. Thank you very much, Alan. Again, we really appreciate everyone's time today, and we really appreciate the support and the feedback that members have had over the last six weeks. I think we've had over 10 regional industry council meetings in the last six weeks and put out over 20 publications as an association. And the only way that we're able to do that is due to the very strong support that you and your staff have been providing to the association when it comes to preparing best practice documents and really adjust, addressing these challenges head on. So again, on behalf of all of the association staff, we'd like to thank you for all the effort that you've put into the industry and the support that you've provided and the great work that you're doing to keep your employees safe out on these job sites. So thank you again, and I'll turn it back over to you, Alan. Okay, thank you, Bart. Uh, just some housekeeping items before we do get started. Uh, so this will be approximately a 60 minute webinar and we will have questions and answers at the end. Uh, all participants are currently muted and will remain that way for the uh, remainder of the uh, webinar. If you do have a question, please use the GoToWebinar questions pane on the right side of your screen and type in your question. We will address all questions at the end. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Concrete Ontario YouTube channel. Um, and to make it easier for everybody, we will send a copy, a PDF version uh, of the presentation and a link to the YouTube video. Um, it will be emailed to all participants uh, in the next few days. Now, in terms of your presenters, myself, Alan Carey, uh, you have Bart Cantors, and then we have our good friends from the Cement Association of Canada, Martha Murray, who's the Director of Public Affairs of uh, Sustainability and Stakeholder Engagement. And we also have Steve Morrissey, the Executive Vice President uh, of the Cement Association of Canada, helping us out today. Um, and the agenda looks like this. So we will provide an update about the field testing initiative, um, ACI certification courses, and also, I'll also talk a little bit about the municipal concrete paving guide. Um, Bart's going to look at the City of Toronto Construction Hub pilot safety project that's going on right now, um, and also the life cycle assessment of ready mixed concrete. There's lots of developments there. And then we have Steve helping us out with um, federal support for businesses. There's been a lot of uh, information coming out of the government, um, so Steve is going to summarize that for us. And then lastly, Martha will be providing an Ontario political update um, so everybody can get an understanding what's happening in, in Ontario. So first, to kick it off, our field testing initiative. Um, we have been working with uh, ACI and CCIL you know, to kick off this initiative. We developed our checklists you know, to try to improve things on site. We want to make sure people are certified. We want to make sure people are sampling and protecting cylinders. So we did create these checklists um, last year. We transitioned this into an electronic version. Um, and we've been tracking the submissions coming in from members on um, inadequate testing that's been happening on sites. So summarized since September, We've um, received numerous complaints. Um, there's four different companies that are primarily using the checklist. And you can see the numbers here of how many submissions we've received. And then the idea is to take those submissions with proof, with pictures, and approach labs to try to re resolve some of the issues. So we approached three different testing labs in September. Uh, the first lab was uh, had issues with an uncertified technician on site. We reached out to the lab in November. Um, and they resolved the issue overnight by sending somebody who is certified. Uh, for lab number two in December, we were tracking initial curing problems on site. Um, the light bulbs were not working inside the curing boxes, so we tracked that for a few weeks. Uh, we approached the lab, sat down with them, explained the initiative, and again, the um, curing boxes were moved inside a trailer, and that was resolved very quickly. Uh, lab number three in December, we were getting some. Um, submissions about plastic testing that was being conducted 
sorry, plastic testing that was not being conducted, but cylinders were still cast for that concrete. Um, so we wanted to make sure that all the testing was being conducted before cylinders were cast, and that was resolved very quickly. And the last one, um, the same lab had issues properly transporting cylinders. Um, and again, we approached them, explained the issue. So it's all very positive. Everybody's working with us to resolve these issues, and the initiative is working the way it's intended to. Here's just uh, the lab number two where we had improper initial curing. You can see um, curing box was not working properly. The min-max thermometer wasn't working. And then after we reached out, they did move it inside the site trailer. So that was great. And lab three here, you can see the improper transportation that was happening of the cylinders, which can have a major impact on the results. Um, so we reached out saying this is unacceptable. We want it uh, fixed as soon as possible. And they did address those issues immediately. So testing initiative is working, but what's the next step when it comes to this? Um, initial curing continues to be the main problem, maintaining the cylinders between 15 and 25 degrees. Um, so we are looking at using some technology. I, I reached out to Exact, uh, who's a company that specializes in sensors, and they sent me some information about pro projects downtown. And here's just a basic graph that their sensors can provide. Um, you can see these temperatures were just monitored. They were not maintained. And you can see uh, it does fall outside the bounds of 15 to 25 degrees, which can have a detrimental impact on the cylinders. The next graph, here's another example, downtown Toronto, where the curing boxes were actually unplugged. The temperature went in the negative um, and the cylinders were still green in the morning. And it's very easy to explain to a testing lab um, wh where things went wrong when you have information such as this. And then the last example, here's curing boxes maintained at 22 degrees consistently. Um, and you can see there's no variation. These cylinders are being cured exactly how they're supposed to be. And we're really looking at implementing something like this. So we were going to run some trials before COVID-19 impacted us uh, it's at numerous sites downtown Toronto. And what we're looking at is potentially pursuing um, something in, CSA, in the CSA standard. Uh, CSA 23.1 of ensuring that the cylinders are maintained between 15 and 25 degrees, similar to how OPSS Municipal 904 has a temperature control plan um, for slab, for example, where you need to indicate what you're going to be doing to maintain the temperature, um, how you're going to do it. We will be hopefully pushing for some kind of technology in the near future to ensure that the cylinders on site will be maintained between 15 and 25 degrees. Now, ACI certifications, just a brief update there. Um, ACI Flatwork certification is now mandatory as per OPSS 351 and 353, which are the sidewalk and curb specs in Ontario. Since November, we have conducted uh, courses for 85 individuals through LIUNA and their own courses. Uh, we're supposed to run a course for the city of Thunder Bay, who has already mandated the requirement of ACI certification as part of all their contracts for this year. Unfortunately, we were unable to go up to Thunder Bay to conduct the, the courses for them. There was 30 plus individuals and um, we will be pushing that until November, but it's great to see municipalities already adopting the certification, which is only gonna improve the finishing in Ontario. And the city of Ottawa is in active talks to implement the certification requirement in 2021. Uh, we're gonna be pursuing this with more municipalities in the near future. The ACI SEC course still going strong. Um, ACI Eastern and Quebec chapter have reached out to us to conduct a course for them so we can get them up and running. And Concrete Alberta has reached out to us as well to go to Calgary and um, run a course for them so they can get up and running. So this course is going national and hopefully we can start putting it as part of the CPCI, the precast guys' specs, um, and even, maybe even the MTO in the near future, but the course is doing very well. Now, the big question we've been getting is what's going to happen to extensions? Um, we're unable to run courses. We've postponed them numerous times. Um, we've reached out to ACI International to get an, an answer from them about extensions. And their viewpoint right now is that they will not be granting extensions, period. Um, there's reasons why they don't want to grant extensions, which they're not getting into. But overall, that's their stance. Um, we said that this is unacceptable. Um, we're not allowed to meet with more than five individuals, creates a lot of challenges considering our ACI certification is mandated in specifications. Um, but overall, 
we're still in talks to them to see what's going to happen there. Um, one approach could be, you know, to grant extensions to already certify technicians and not certify new technicians. But again, ACI has not um, been very cooperative um, in granting any kind of extensions. We had a meeting with CCIL um, and they're unable to currently grant uh, do lab inspections um, and they potentially will be granting extensions for their technicians, which we again notified ACI of. But uh, we should have more information in the coming weeks of how everything's going to work out there. And the last issue, um, topic I'm going to be covering is municipal concrete paving guide that we developed. So this guide was debuted at uh, the Municipal Engineers Conference in November. It's an interactive guide showing all sorts of Ontario projects over the last few years. Um, the guide's going to keep being updated with new projects, and it's really to help municipalities, you know, take the leap of try different applications, whether it's bus pads, turning lanes, whatever else, to try concrete and see the many benefits that it offers. Um, the OGRA did have their first annual municipal concrete award back in February. There's three submissions and uh, the winner was City of Vaughan 7-3 Fire Station. You can see the result here. Very beautiful project that, that we've been highlighting the last few months. And uh, we will continue to be working with municipalities to increase the market share for members when it comes to concrete pavements. Now, Tim and I, Tim Smith from the Cement Association, and I will be running um, municipal sem uh, webinars next week and uh, every month. Um, registrations have been very strong. We have 90 plus people, primarily municipal folks. So we will be making quite an impact on municipal pavements in the coming years. Now we'll turn it over to uh, Bart to provide an update about the City of Toronto Construction Hub Pilot Safety Project. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks for that. Uh, just a few projects that we want to go through and highlight. Uh, the first one is the construction hub. Unfortunately, last year during the summer, there were three pedestrian fatalities in the Young and Eglinton area. Uh, one was related to the ready mix industry. Because of that, the City of Toronto created a new safety working group to try and address pedestrian safety uh, initiatives. And this was the outcome of that project. So if we jump to the next slide. So really what they did is they identified in that Young and Eglinton corridor in the GTA, there's a massive amount of construction work that's taking place between the Eglinton Crosstown LRT and about 10 high-rise condominium projects that are all going up in that area, along with the city's normal utility and maintenance work that's taking place. So we've got a very congested, congested work corridor and a lot of different contractors doing various things that impact the road, road, roadway area and pedestrians. So really the, the intent of this project was to really address the safety issues. So if we jump to the next slide, uh, what the City of Toronto decided to do was create one city representative, the hub coordinator, that would be responsible for coordinating all aspects of the City of Toronto's work with local contractors and with local developers uh, trying to ensure improvements to safety. So really the objective was to have one dedicated person down in that location that would coordinate with all of the local construction projects that are going on in that area, that would also act as a liaison to the local residents to let them know what's going on, to coordinate with the various city services, whether it's traffic management, uh, traffic enforcement or bylaw enforcement, um, sewer and water main issues for temporary connections and disruptions, those types of issues, and try and improve coordination. So if we jump to the next slide. Really, the objective, as we said, was really about trying to improve the communication between all the different players. What the hub coordinator is doing is forcing all of the construction companies in that hub corridor to offer four week look ahead schedules. And then they have uh, two hour meetings once every two weeks uh, to sit down and review the construction schedule and while they won't force contractors to change their construction schedule, they want everyone to be aware of all the different road closures and major projects that are taking place. So for example, if one developer is doing a, a 3,000 meter raft slab pour on a Saturday, um, 
and there's going to be road closures, the other contractors need to know. And if they can schedule some of their road work that they were intending to do shortly during that road closure, then we'll try and improve that coordination. So jumping to the next slide. Oh, I got the old one. Okay, good. The other critical thing that came out of this uh, related related to pedestrian safety. And again, we had some very significant talks with the City of Toronto on what we could do to uh, improve pedestrian safety. Uh, we highlighted a lot of the work that the association has done when it comes to our blind spot awareness program. And again, that was very well received. But really, we sat down and looked at what were the available options. Uh, unfortunately for us, the City of Toronto started off initially talking about significant driver training requirements. Um, and again, there's lots of legislation that relates to the trucking industry. Um, so we quickly realized that's not really the best approach. The better approach was to look at what can we do from a proactive driver awareness standpoint. So jumping to the next slide. What we did as a group, we had about eight different associations that were represented at the table at the end of the day. And we sat down and addressed what are the 10 major safety tips that we can pass along both to industry association drivers and to City of Toronto drivers. The City of Toronto has a significant number of dr drivers as well. And so we went through and identified 10 major safety tips and then created a campaign around that. So jumping to the next slide. So what the intent from industry associations was, was to create an electronic document that we could send out to all the drivers in the industry. And from a concrete standpoint, since we employ the majority of our drivers ourselves and we have lunch rooms and shared spaces, we created a, a two foot by three foot poster that we could put up in public areas at the concrete plant to address the 10 safety tips that we developed. So that was launched by the safety committee about a week and a half ago. And again, really good interaction with the other associations in the industry and with the City of Toronto. Jumping ahead. So where we're at right now, we've got this one construction hub at Young and Eglinton that's going very well. Again, uh, we're seeing really good coordination uh, with the various players. Quite frankly, from an association standpoint, over the last four months, we're having meetings 45-minute uh, meetings once every two weeks, and we've never had this level of coordination and communication with the City of Toronto. It's been extremely positive for the industry. We're able to bring up other issues that relate to the industry, such as the list of essential services, and City of Toronto immediately addressed that issue and put out a list of all of the essential services that they have that concrete should be supplied to. So we're seeing really good activity here. and more importantly, addressing the safety issues. Jumping to the next slide, the city intends to expand this program. So the intent was to start in May with two additional construction hubs. So hub number two was gonna be the area between Queen and College and Bay and Jarvis. And then jumping to the next slide, hub number three was gonna be right down at the waterfront. So it was gonna be Queens Quay to Front Street and Bathurst to Cherry as the safety areas. So each, when they're up and running, they've been put on hold due to the challenges that everyone is dealing with when it comes to COVID-19. But when they're up and running, we will have three different construction hubs in the city of Toronto, all with their own individual coordinator to try and address safety issues. Okay, next slide. So finishing that off, um, as part of our commitment to the city, we had intended in April to do a safety awareness month. Uh, we produced over 200 posters and uh, also created some stickers that could be placed up in the construction areas regarding uh, our blind spot awareness program that we developed a few years ago. So again, we're really looking forward to supporting the city in their efforts here. Next slide. So the next topic that we're going to jump to is life cycle assessment of ready mix concrete. Over the last really six or seven months, the Cement Association and Concrete Ontario have been working closely together on a number of projects, um, trying to address the sustainability of concrete and highlight how sustainable our material really is. So jumping to the next slide, we're working currently with the uh, National Research Council on their low carbon assets 
through life cycle assessment, the LCA squared initiative. Uh, again, we're having monthly meetings with the NRC trying to address how, as an industry, we can move to ensuring that owners, developers, and contractors understand uh, the CO2 consequences of the decisions that they make and how we can highlight the innovative uses of low carbon concrete and cement on those projects. So jumping to the next slide, uh, when we think about life cycle cost analysis, often our approach in the past was to, to think of it from the basically 2080 or the 9010 split that uh, initial construction really represented a small portion, 10 to 20% of all of the CO2 in the, in the building. But over the last few years, with the dramatic change to the electrical grid here in Ontario by getting rid of coal as a fuel source, uh, the electrical grid has really cleaned up a lot in Ontario, and it's had a huge impact on the uh, life cycle cost implications of the energy efficiency of the buildings. So what we're seeing when you look at this graph on the screen, in the past we assumed that the operating carbon, the yellow portion of the triangle, was very significant. But now that we've made some very dramatic changes to uh, the energy grid here in Ontario, uh, the operating contributions have reduced significantly. So again, there's a greater focus on uh, what we can do at the initial construction stage because it now represents a bigger component of what we need to address. And then the, the little box here on the, on the graph highlighting 12 years, again, ties back to uh, the federal government's commitments to Kyoto and other environmental protocols that there's a huge focus to quantify the amount of reductions that industry is implementing. So we've been doing a very good job of implementing CO2 reductions, but it's critical that we have to be able to highlight that, and quantify that in a measurable way for government so that they can understand it. So jumping to the next slide, where we're at right now, um, we were working with the federal government treasury board uh, they were intending to do a request for a proposal, send out information to the entire uh, construction industry across the country. And the three questions that they were going to raise uh, really related to the following areas. Uh, one was, what was the industry's feedback on the implementation of Portland limestone cement as of September 1st of this year? Uh, the second one was, uh, what was the industry's feedback on implementing type three EPDs for individual concrete mix designs? And then the third concept that they were putting forward for feedback was uh, what's the industry's feedback on the global warming potential limits for concrete components? So jumping back to the first one, uh, sorry, stay back on that slide, thanks. Uh, jumping back to the first one, uh, Portland limestone cement for us here in Ontario, we've seen a very significant uh, uptake in Portland limestone cement. We've been doing research here in Ontario with our members for over 10 years on the benefits of Portland limestone cement. And I know from dealing with many of the members on technical committees and other standards, there's really no technical challenges when it comes to Portland limestone cement. It's a really effective solution. It's a one-for-one -one replacement. Really the only challenge for us is just an, uh, an operational one in ensuring that uh, we're able to supply it across the board uh, for projects. So that date of September 1, I'm sure, is going to change given everything that's happened recently. But again, I think we're in a very strong position when it comes to uh, Ontario in adopting Portland limestone cement. And it offers a significant 10% reduction in CO2 right off the top. So it's that's really the, the no-brainer option. The other two challenge, uh, items that were put forward are definitely a little more challenging. Uh, we've only done an industry average EPD for ready mix concrete for the entire country. So that was an average for the entire country. What they're looking for with the second one is facility specific EPDs. So while we support that idea and we support the idea of quantifying CO2, we've got a lot of work to do as an industry to, to get ready for that and to address that. But it's definitely doable, but it's a time issue and we definitely need to develop some tools to, in order to do that. And we're working very closely with NRC and the Cement Association on that. And the third option, uh, which we've seen in the United States, is uh, moving to a performance system where you just limit the total amount of CO2 per cubic meter. So now we'll jump to the next slide. 
and we'll show uh, the Marin County example in California. Um, again, we don't like the second column because it's there's really a performance option and a prescriptive option that California has adopted here. So you can see in the first column they're setting uh, the compressive strength in imperial units, so PSI. And then once you've once the designer has selected their compressive strength or the contractor has selected a com compressive strength, then you have the two acceptance columns. One is uh, a prescriptive limitation based on cement content, which we clearly don't support here in Ontario because we don't disclose mixed proportions, or the performance option of identifying what's your maximum CO2 per cubic meter uh, for that particular mix. So again, the, the third column is more acceptable to the industry and is definitely something that we want to achieve, uh, but we've got some work to go to get there. So jumping to the next slide. So what do we need to do this? There's a lot of work going on right now on getting the industry prepared for this. Um, when we look at the idea of quantifying CO2, we've got to go back to the raw material side and look at our three primary raw materials and look at, do we have the necessary EPD information? So that's one of the challenges that we're currently facing with all of our suppliers when it comes to, do we have facility-specific EPD information available. Second bullet relates to us as, as the ready mix industry. So when we did our industry average EPD, we randomly picked 45 of our 270 concrete plants to do a detailed uh, survey on in order to collect the critical information. So when it comes to a facility-specific EPD, you need to look at what's the total amount of diesel fuel you used in the previous year? What's the total amount of natural gas? What's the total amount of, of fuel oil if you use fuel oil? What's your total amount of electricity? And then what was the total amount of concrete that you produced in that previous year? So what it does, it then gives you a per cubic meter inputs on what your critical uh, raw or energy units are. So for the industry, for the ready mix industry, diesel fuel is obviously our biggest input that has the most impact followed by electricity and natural gas after that. So really what we're trying to do is work with uh, the NRC, work with the Cement Association and all the provincial associations on how can we create um, a generic calculator that we can use to easily and effectively calculate these numbers. And then we designers really want to look at regional data. So national data is not acceptable. They want it at least at the provincial level. And for Ontario, there's been requests for three or four regions within the province. So those are challenges that we'll be working through over the next few months. So jumping to the next slide. Last one on the safety initiative. Uh, just before COVID-19 hit, we just produced our concrete driver pump safety guidelines. So again, we're very happy to uh, put together a new safety document that deals with concrete pumping. Um, in our efforts working with uh, Martha Murray at the Cement Association, we have some very significant goals when it comes to working with the Ministry of Labor. So again, from a safety standpoint, concrete pumping still represents one of the most significant safety challenges for the industry. So again, we're pushing for the recognition of the CSA concrete pumping safety standard. Uh, we're pushing for some form of recognizable operator certification program for the concrete pumping industry. So whether it's a union program, a non-union program, a, but we need to see a formal system. Uh, WorkSafe BC and the BC Ready Mix Association have developed a program out there uh, to try and address this. But again, as an industry, we just need to see some type of training put in place. And then we've got outreach going on with the Ontario general contractors around contractor safety concerns. So again, we'd like to see a safety document for contractors as well to close the loop here. And jumping to the next one. So COVID-19, I'm just gonna let Alan cycle through these slides quickly. But uh, obviously, as I said at the start, we've been doing a lot of publications over the last six months related to COVID-19. They're all available on our website under the safety section in COVID-19. Um, so again, hopefully you'll have time to reach out and have a look at them. And I'll leave it at that. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Bart.
Uh, next up, we have Steve uh, to provide an overview of the federal support for businesses aspect. Uh, thank you, Alan, and good morning, everyone. I don't think I have to mention to, to anyone the terrible economic impacts of uh, the pandemic, and we're very concerned about how this is impacting the construction industry. Obviously, uh, as cement and concrete producers, there's uh, without construction, there are no there are no customers, and that's so. The goal, really, from uh, looking through the pandemic, is to ensure that that the uh, construction industry remains viable. And I think the biggest concerns that the gov federal government and the provincial government have recognized is that uh, liquidity is a, is a big concern. So uh, very briefly, I'm going to highlight what the um, programs that have been announced so far by the federal government. A lot of the details are still forthcoming and there will be new details coming day to day. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I've provided uh, specific links to the federal government website for each of the programs that I'm going to have an overview on. And there's a couple of question and answer websites that the government has that are actually quite useful, particularly for the, uh, the wage subsidy program. So next slide, please. So the, the federal government, what they have is called an economic response plan. and um, there's been a couple of sittings of parliament to pass a couple of pieces of legislation and more will be forthcoming. I'm not gonna to talk today about the, the, uh, the wage assistance uh, for individuals. I'm just gonna to stick to the business programs. Uh, the, one, the first one that was announced was a temporary wage subsidy uh, was 10% for three months to a maximum of $25,000. Now that quickly got put to the wayside because um, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses and other business groups lobbied saying that was insufficient so the 75 percent program kind of replaces that but if people it is still available and people still can apply but if they also if you also are eligible for the weight the 75 percent wage subsidy that 10 percent program will be taken off from the total amount you can apply uh, two i think important uh, elements are deferring income tax payments until basically september of this year We'll see if that gets further delayed, uh, depending on how long the provincial lockdowns last. And GST uh, remittances and uh, duty payments for any material coming across the border for construction projects, those can also be deferred not quite as long, and hopefully those will be uh, deferred for further periods of time. Uh, the big program, sort of the centerpiece that the government has announced is the Canada, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy Program called QS. Uh, it's a, a subsidized wages at a rate of 75% up to $847 per employee. Um, more details on that in the following slides. And then the liquidity part is the business credit, uh, credit availability programs. There are two components uh, under that. One is the CBA, the Candy Emergency Business Account, that's run through uh, the banks and uh, that, that companies have with their existing accounts. And the other is a small medium enterprise loan that's run through BDC and EDC. Uh, what was announced uh, not too long ago, but all the details haven't been released, is that is the uh, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program for small business. Now, there, um, this program is going to provide some rent assistance. It's going to require both the landlord and the uh, and the tenant to contribute to uh, the three months of rent going forward. Uh, but it, it requires that the landlord uh, take part of the program. Next slide, please. So I mentioned these, so just quickly, Income Tax Act can defer filing dates and, and payments. Now, depending on how um, your company makes the payments, you, you may have to uh, call, call your uh, account rep at CRA to uh, find out how to manage these. CRA is saying it's not going to charge interest or penalties on these amounts during the period. On HST, GST, uh, businesses can defer uh, those remittances until June 30th. And as I mentioned before, also um, on customs duties. Next slide. Uh, the, the Canada Emergency Way Subsidy Program, queues, as I mentioned, up to 75% um, to a maximum of 847 per employee per week. Uh, the 12 weeks is broken into three periods from March 15th to June 6th. 
Uh, it can be applied uh, retroactively. It's meant to encourage people to re-employ uh, people that have been put on furlough or laid off. Um, to qualify, a company has to have experienced a decline in revenues of at least 15% in March and 30% in April or May of this year. The calculation is done by comparing uh, year over year revenues, um, but there's also an amended formula that you can apply the average of January or February to each of the previous uh, months, but you have to use that formula for each month. And you have to qualify for each month of the program. Um, they did make one amendment that saying if you qualify for one period, you would automatically qualify for the next period. Um, the federal government expects uh, employers to make the best efforts to return to uh, make sure employees get 100% of their salary, but that isn't an absolute requirement under the legislation. Um, another positive element I think of this is that uh, there's a refund of payroll contributions, whether it be um, employment insurance or CPP or PPP, um, that these entire amounts can be, um, can be paid back for furloughed employees. Next slide. To some practical uh, considerations for queues. It does require that um, the, the primary financial officer attest to the, the revenue in the applications. And uh, it does, the system does allow uh, your accountants to actually make the application on your behalf, which provides a bit of liability uh, protection if necessary, because every company is different. And uh, although, um, the government has outlined these qualification guidelines. They have indicated that they want to make sure it's open to as many people as possible. So there may be individual cases of unique revenue situations, which uh, will have to be sort of negotiated with uh, the people um, at CRA. So um, it, you, there's an online calculator that everyone can use to, to see how much you are eligible for. It will pre-populate some sheets that can be used in the actual application process. And if you don't uh, have a CRA My Business account, you can set one up, uh, which will allow you to get the, the money uh, as quickly as possible. Now, it appears over 40,000 companies have already started to apply. The uh, Monday was the, the opening date. And they, they are saying that um, it will only take a week for some of the companies to get the money, although we're already starting to hear some concerns about uh, delays and some getting through to the, uh, to the necessary people. Next slide, please. Now I wanna talk about um, the business credit availability program. Um, there's $65 billion set aside for uh, financial support. This is lending. And as I mentioned before, there's two uh, programs in this. It's the CBA, the Canada Business uh, Emergency Business Account, provides interest-free credit of up to $40,000 for small businesses and nonprofits. Uh, the guidelines were changed because a lot of people were complaining wouldn't apply for them. It uh, requires that you've demonstrated that you've paid uh, total payroll between $20,000 to $1.5 million in 2019. The previous range was $50,000 to $1 million. So some smaller companies or uh, there's a lot of companies in our sector that uh, where owners, managers are paid in different forms of compensation, whether it be through dividends or otherwise, which would otherwise make the, the companies not qualify. So they've reduced the payroll range. Uh, these loans can be um, out uh, repaid by December 20, December 31st, 2022, and 10 per, or sorry, 25% of that will be forgiven. So um, that's not a bad uh, opportunity but a lot of people are complaining that $40,000 just isn't enough liquidity if it's intended to cover operating expenses and uh, inventories and whatnot. The other programs uh, that are administered uh, through EDC and the Business Development Bank of uh, Canada are for larger loan programs and basically they're providing guarantees of up to 80% of those facilities. Um, they basically require existing relationships between these lenders and your own lenders and their qualification uh, guidelines are, um, the, are the ones that uh, the government will be funding through. So there remain some issues there. Next slide, please. Um, recently announced is the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program. 
this is uh, a program that hasn't been fully um, documented in terms of how it specifically will be run. It is going to be administered through the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and it's intended that um, these forgivable loans will be dispersed directly from CMHC uh, to mortgage lenders. So there is a big outstanding question whether you, you can, if you own your own commercial facility, obviously you're kind of shit out of luck. Um, so where some people are asking for additional or additional considerations for people who have operating expenditures but uh, aren't necessarily renting their own facilities. So uh, the program is for people, uh, companies paying less than $50,000 a month and have temporarily ceased operations or have experienced at least a 70% drop in pre-COVID revenues. So that threshold is pretty limiting and I'm, I would expect that the government is going to hear a lot of uh, further complaints about opening up and making that less restrictive for uh, a number of different situations. How the program runs is the landlord will, will uh, provide forgivable loans to the commercial property owners to cover 50% of three monthly rent payments um, for April, May, and June. The small business tenant would cover the remainder up to 25% of the rent. And as I mentioned, the uh, CMHC is going to administer the program. So uh, next slide, please. Other support. Now, the government has announced a couple of programs to deal with rural communities and kind of a catch-all in case of uh, situations that uh, people can't apply. Uh, the, need, the need relief. Uh, this program is called the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund, uh, mostly for rural businesses and communities, and uh, it's, it's run through Canada's regional development agencies. So there's one for Northern Ontario and there's one for Southern Ontario. Um, there's also a program being run through the Community Futures Development Corporations. Um, so that existing framework may be available to uh, companies in, in uh, smaller communities. And the government has also dumped um, uh, $250 million into IRAP to support SRNED programs. So this might be a good time for any, any research projects to, uh, to get pushed along. Next slide. Um, some of the concerns about the, the federal programs are the eligibility requirements are too restrictive. Uh, the banks are still administering a lot of the programs and they have strict eligibility criteria and the application processes are are onerous and a lot of businesses need cash now. And they can't wait until some of these programs roll out. Uh, many companies are saying that the $40,000 loan isn't enough to cover operational costs. There are some uh, call centers are overwhelmed and, and website issues with some of the application process. And one of the other issues that we've heard is that uh, it's difficult getting uh, casual laborers because they're more interested in collecting the CERB, the personal payments and, and not uh, coming to work or slightly increased uh, amounts from some employers. Uh, and then of course, we've already seen uh, insolvency potential out in the environment that uh, these programs have just been rolled out too late and waiting for some of the money will, will take too long. Next slide. Uh, so this is, I know I've gone very quickly through some of these programs, I apologize, um, but for each of these programs, there's a link provided on, on this page and feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any particular questions. And uh, as I said, I expect there'll be more announcements or more amendments to some of these programs as the economic conditions continue to be felt across Canada. And uh, Martha's going to touch on some of what the province of Ontario is doing to help. And um, we'll continue to send out updates to um, uh, any um, business programs uh, through our monitors. So thank you very much for the opportunity, and I'll pass back to Tom. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, that's great. Um, obviously, there's a lot of resources for people. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions for this webinar, please type in your question into the question pane, and we'll address all the questions at the end. Uh, next, I'll turn it over to uh, Martha to provide the Ontario political update. Thanks, Alan. Um, I thought I'd just start, uh, just the next slide, please. 
Um, I thought I'd just start by giving a bit of a rundown on um, what's been going on since the, the beginning of the COVID, um, COVID crisis. Can you just flip to the next slide? Perfect. Um, so it was March 24th when Premier Doug Ford announced that all non-essential services be closed as of midnight that day. And it was at that time on March 24th that construction was deemed an essential service and allowed to continue. Uh, the following day, March 25th, the Ontario government released its uh, economic and fiscal update entitled Ontario's Action Plan. This was a revised um, update. It had originally been planned as a full budget and we saw how quickly things moved when only two weeks um, uh, it had changed into just a, an economic and fiscal update to uh, address the COVID crisis. In that there were a few business initiatives that were included, included um, in that we're providing five months of interest and penalty relief for the majority of provincially administered taxes allowing employers to defer premium payments to the WSIB for up to six months, um, electricity cost relief for eligible um, small business consumers, and then also cutting taxes through a proposed temporary increase to the employer health tax exemption. So there were a few uh, business initiatives in that, although the majority of items were uh, focused on the healthcare sector. It was also at that day, the province launched a toll-free line, which was available for uh, individuals, for businesses to reach out and find out which um, businesses were considered essential and if there were any questions related to essential services within the province. On April 3rd, uh, the on Ontario released its public health modeling and projections and it was at this time that the government took additional steps to restrict the number of businesses classified as essential. And it was on this date that some construction was deemed non-essential. Next slide, please. So I think I don't need to run through this very um, uh, much in detail in that, um, you know, the following construction has been deemed essential services. So those uh, related to the healthcare sector, including new facilities, expansions, renovations, uh, construction that is uh, critical provincial infrastructure, transit, transportation, energy, uh, critical industry, uh, industrial construction activities related to petrochemical plants and refineries, uh, work necessary for the production, maintenance, and or enhancement of personal protective equipment. So those facilities who have um, rejigged their operations, so they're doing masks and medical devices, et cetera. And then also uh, construction, it was added a little bit later, construction projects that are due to be completed before October 4th that would provide additional capacity in the production, processing, manufacturing, or distribution of food, beverages, or agriculture products. Um, certain residential construction projects were allowed to continue with the following um, qualifications as listed below. And then of course, construction and maintenance activities necessary to temporarily close construction sites that have paused. Uh, cement, concrete and aggregate production to support any critical infrastructure was still allowed to continue as, as part of this. Next slide. On April 8th, Ontario announced it would be extending construction hours for essential construction projects to 24 hours a day. So it uh, temporary, temporarily limited local that continue for um, 24 hours such uh, on things such as new hospital builds, et cetera. And it was also an opportunity to uh, uh, allow for staggered working conditions to increase the health and safety of, of workers. On April 9th, the uh, province an, uh, announced the Ontario Jobs and Recovery Committee and, and, it, and the uh, Premier appointed several key cabinet ministers, there were 13 in total, to develop a plan for after COVID-19 and how to grow the economy um, in the aftermath of, of the pandemic. So the mandate is to, um, to focus on getting businesses up and running and people back to work after, after the pandemic and, and, by, and for developing a plan to stimulate economic growth. On April 14th, the province announced the state of emergency is extended until May 12th and April 24th, um, as Steve mentioned, was the rental relief, uh, the 
with the provincial government uh, partnering with the federal government. Next slide, please. I think in as a result of increased pressure, I think the Premier was um, anxious to release a plan for reopening the economy. I think both the public and businesses were anxious to see what the province was thinking in terms of how to reopen the economy. So just this past Monday, Monday the uh, Premier released the framework for reopening the economy. Uh, it has no timelines or specifics um, attached to it, so it was very vague in nature. Uh, certain benchmarks are needed to be achieved before the reopening can occur. The framework outlines three stages of reopening and it's anticipated that two to three weeks will, um, uh, there will be two to three weeks between each stage until you reach the next one. And the job and recovery um, cabinet committee will be consulting with the public and specific uh, and business on the specific details of this um, reopening. So just to quickly go through, next slide please, the benchmarks for reopening. The province needs to see a two to four week decline in the number of new daily cases. Uh, there has to be enough acute and critical care capacity. There needs to be ongoing testing of suspected cases and approximately 90% of new COVID-19 contacts are being re reached by public health officials within one day. The three stages of reopening. Uh, the first one, it would be the opening of select workplaces that can modify operations, such as allowing curbside pickup to meet public health guidance. So we're looking at probably some of the big box stores, some of the garden centers, et cetera, opening some outdoor spaces like parks and allowing for a greater number of individuals to attend some events, uh, such as funerals. Um, and hospitals to offer some non-urgent and scheduled surveys and other healthcare services. We heard uh, yesterday there were some statistics re released about the um, modeled number of deaths that have happened uh, non-COVID related as a result of the restrictions placed on, on some of the surgeries. So um, the, the health minister has already said that cancer surgeries are, are the type of surgery that would uh, begin to be allowed uh, during this first stage of reopening. The second stage would see a more opening of workplaces, which may include some service industries and office and retail workplaces. Some larger public gatherings would be allowed and more outdoor spaces would open. And third, finally, the opening of all workplaces responsibly, responsibly and further relaxing of restrictions on public gatherings. So you can see from the, the stages, it's still very, very vague. Uh, not a lot of specifics given. And um, certainly it looks like that, you know, we're going to have to see a two to four week decline in the number of new cases. And we are seeing a general trend right now. The cases are going down, but it's certainly too easy to, or too early to see whether or not that is, is, is going to sustain itself. So um, we've still got, a, you know, a few weeks off before we start to see a reopening likely. Um, next slide, please. I think key also with that is that, um, well, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but we'll be re-engaging re with the Economic and Jobs Recovery um, Committee as part of that, uh, of, a part of the plans for reopening. So in terms of advocacy, we have been advocating on your behalf quite um, a lot during the last couple of months specifically. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to the association if you do have questions or concerns with respect to any level of government and issues you might be having. Um, some of the plans that we had originally started in January have been um, sidelined slightly as uh, there's been a need to be flexible as there's a rapidly changing landscape in the province. We sent a premier and a letter to the premier and I think this was outlined earlier in the slides that um, you know this was at the end of March uh, stressing that construction construction should be considered an essential service. There were copies sent to the Premier's Chief of Staff and the Ministers of Infrastructure, Transportation, Labour and Skills Development, Finance, Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. We received a call from the Minister of Infrastructure that indeed confirmed at that time that uh, construction would be an essential service, but that it was really contingent on ensuring that health and safety were paramount and at each of the construction sites. 
we've been having ongoing outreach to Minister McNaughton's office, that's labor and skills development. Um, as Bart mentioned, uh, we've been highlighting the Concrete Ontario's COVID-19 best practices, the CAC COVID-19's best practices for the aggregate cement and concrete industries. These have been sent to various ministries and we've certainly been stressing that with the Ministry of Labor. We've been able to receive clarification on agriculture construction as an essential service through the minister's office. I'll be speaking with the minister's office actually after this call to get some clarification on a few other items. So we're in constant contact with that office just to um, ensure that they're up to date with what we're doing and to answer any questions that you might have. Next slide, please. Just over a week ago, we sent a joint letter to the Jobs and Recovery Committee. As I said, there's 13 cabinet ministers as part of that committee. We, in the letter, we stressed the impact of the industry and the importance of stimulating local economic activity by proceeding with infrastructure projects. And we also offered to assist with the recovery plan. I think this was our just our first step to say, hey, we're here and we're willing and wanting to help. So uh, we'll be following up on that to see how we can actually provide some um, input and practical solutions to the committee as they start to deliberate about the reopening and next steps of the economic recovery. Um, when I say it's a joint letter, the letter went from Concrete Ontario and the Cement Association. And we also um, have sent out a joint letter from the CAC and Concrete Ontario to municipalities across Ontario. The importance of uh, proceeding with local infrastructure and not delaying building permits or tenders so that we're able to um, continue once things open. Um, so that went out as well. BART is a member of the province's new construction table. Again, this is a new table that was organized by the Ministry of Labour, but has input from the Ministries of Infrastructure, Transportation and Municipal Affairs. I think also the Premier's office is a part of it. And it's looking at health and safety measures and federal support measures and essential service orders and, and municipal permit review and, and inspections. So um, the Concrete Ontario is a part of that new construction table. And then we have ongoing advocacy with the Minister of Transportation's office and the MTO, uh, specifically around electronic ticketing. And we have an, a follow-up call on that today where we hope to be able to get some resolution uh, to the issue of electronic ticketing and ensuring the safety of our, of our drivers so that uh, paper tickets um, aren't needed to be passed between individuals. And also with respect to seasonal loads, we've had done outreach to the uh, ministry. Next slide, please. Finally, um, I thought I'd just touch upon basically a few ongoing advocacy items that are non-COVID related that we've been working on with since January. As I indicated, some of the things that we've started working on have um, been sidelined slightly as we focus on COVID related and the government really focuses on COVID related uh, responses. But we have been working closely with allies to advance mutual priorities with key ministries. We have a working group that uh, is informally called Concrete Wins, and it consists of uh, the Concrete Ontario, the Cement Association, Pipe, the Aggregates Industry, Precast, and others. And we meet, we've met um, twice already, and we have another meeting scheduled for May where we talk about what our common priorities within ministries and how we can approach them as a group together in order to advance items of mutual interest. That's an ongoing working group that um, has recently been formed since before Christmas. And it's been uh, very helpful in terms of getting um, our messaging on the same page and all allies working together to advance um, priorities amongst the industry. We're likely in May going to switch our gears a little bit more to focus on how we can be part of the solution to the economic recovery. Concrete Ontario specific advocacy, we've been doing a lot of work with the WSIB over the last several months. Uh, Concrete Ontario is now a member of the Chair's Construction Industry Advisory Committee where we're able to provide input into health and safety practices and um, the WSIB at uh, the table with the chair of the WSIB and the president. 
We've also had several meetings with uh, Labor and WSIB to deal with claim issues such as auto approving and timelines. Um, and we'll be scheduling a follow-up meeting with them shortly. We had had one scheduled, but uh, with the COVID pandemic that got um, delayed. As well, we've been also working on issues such as uh, driver shortages with the Ministry of Labor and also insurance in issues. We've had preliminary meetings to discuss and we'll, we're going to be with the insurance agent industry and the aggregates industry. And we're also going to be scheduling a meeting in the next little while to, uh, to follow up on that and how we can start to address some of those issues. And finally, next slide. I've just, I've um, gone through things very quickly, but uh, if you have any uh, additional questions Questions related to the, the Ontario government specifically or any other uh, levels of government, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to uh, look into it and, and talk to Bart and uh, Alan and how we can uh, address some of the concerns that you're uh, facing. So thanks very much and I'll turn it over to Alan. Thank you very much, Martha. That's great. Uh, it's a perfect update uh, this morning. Um, the next part it will be uh, questions. So we, we did receive some questions in regards to today's webinar. Um, let me outline the first one. Looks like it's a question for Bart. Um, what do we do if our cement supplier can't provide us with GUL and is specified on a project? So back to your LCA squared initiative. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's a lot of understanding. We're, we're trying to work through those issues right now. The cement industry, is really making a strong push to address those types of concerns. Um, really it comes down to recognizing there are low carbon options out there. What we're probably gonna propose is that when it rolls out for first implementation that we have a 12 to 16 month window uh, to allow the industry to switch over and to make the changes because there's some significant logistics challenges uh, for both the ready-mix industry and the cement industry, depending on the location. So I think government is open to the idea of we're, we're setting a new benchmark and we realize it's going to take a few months or a year to implement those changes, but we're, we're moving forward with changes. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is for Martha or Steve. Uh, why is each wage subsidy period of the queues shifted forward by approximately a week from the corresponding month? Hi, I'll try to hand, handle that one. Um, it was basically decided that this is when the uh, the initial period was when uh, most of the shutdown started and most of the impacts were felt. And that's the only justification the federal government has ever given. So basically plucked out of the air. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more for Steve. Uh, my company hasn't qualified for one of the programs, does that mean I have no recourse? It doesn't necessarily mean there's no recourse. The, the government has said that they want to make the program as expansive as possible. If, if it's a borderline issue or if it's a question of, of accounting and special revenue calculations, they've indicated that you can connect directly with a human being instead of a, a, um, just an online process to try to figure a path through through that. If that doesn't work, um, you know, then there is the regional development corporations as a fallback to, to make an application. It doesn't work if you're a company in, in the GTA, however, but um, it is a possibility. And the final uh, would be probably going to, to, uh, to Concrete Ontario or us or the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and doing some direct lobbying for um, qualification. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, next one is for Steve or Martha. Will there be any more assistance for businesses or uh, is this it? Martha? Well, uh, I, I think there was, there's going to be more. I, th I think we, what we've yeah. seen so far is just to address the immediate impacts of the government closing the economy. What we have not really seen is traditional stimulus, which, you know, which we think of and the, 
and thinking back to the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, is, is money to get the economy back. This is just uh, save the furniture financing and, and programs. I think we're going to see uh, a much more uh, robust, actually, uh, stimulus funding coming. And it could be tailored to provide additional um, income or, pardon me, wage support for, for companies. Okay. Uh, I yeah, I would agree with that, that um, I think we're going to see them both at the provincial and federal levels and the Jobs and Recovery Committee will be looking at that, uh, I anticipate, very closely. Great. Um, I can tackle the next question. Uh, it's about uh, the status of our Concrete Ontario plant audit program. We did grant a uh, three-month extension um, based on everything that's happened with COVID-19. So. All upcoming audits have been delayed until June 1st to ensure the, the safety of our auditors. Um, we are in talks with the Ministry of Transportation, who is being difficult um, to extend this any further, considering the um, emergency has been extended by the province of Ontario till May 12th. Um, but we will be pushing for an August 1st date at this point, um, because it's not reasonable for our, our auditors to complete you know, 45 plus plant audits between May 12th and June 1st. Um, so we will be following up with the MTO in the next couple of weeks to try to get that addressed. Okay, next question. Um, Bart, has anyone other than the City of Toronto implemented uh, the construction hub idea? The original idea came from Seattle, Washington. Um, again, we've seen a lot of great input from it here and I know I think we're going to be putting it forward to a number of larger municipalities across the province uh, so we'll be discussing that at future regional industry council meetings giving a highlight on really the improved communication that we're seeing with the city again having people from transportation construction uh, capital works bylaw enforcement all on the same call uh, really has been addressing a lot of the issues that would go months before before we could get an answer for. So having the people right there is having a big impact. So we'll be looking to try and expand that out to other municipalities. Thanks. And just a follow-up question about the safety hub. Um, the comment was made, does it make sense to develop a similar poster to offer safety tips around concrete trucks for cyclists and pedestrians? That is a great idea. Um, again, we're struggling, we, we created these great doc documents. Uh, we were unable to print the safety posts. So before the pandemic hit, we printed all the existing blind spot awareness posters that we had uh, for the city of Toronto to use during their April safety month. Unfortunately, they had to put that on hold. Um, we had also reached out to the Toronto Area School Board and had planned on doing safety visits. So what we'd committed to was doing four uh, grade four bicycle bicycle riding programs with the city of Toronto and actually supplying a ready mix truck to each one of those bicycle programs and marking out on the ground the blind spot areas and then having the students ride bicycles around the truck and other students go through and see how you can't see the kids out on the road. So again, we had lots of great plans there. Um, we may have to delay it till the fall, but uh, again, there's good opportunities there. So thank you. Okay, great. Uh, that's pretty much all the questions. Um, we're almost at 11.10. We don't want to take up too much uh, time. Um, but what's coming up next? Uh, on May 5th, we do have our Introduction to Municipal Concrete Paving webinar with the Cement Association. Um, and the link, registration link, will be provided to everybody. Uh, May 13th, we're looking at SPIF compliance for ready mix trucks. Uh, SPIF is, uh, again, here to stay and uh, we do have Joe Lynch from the MTO to address any concerns about permitting and uh, any concerns regarding SPIF. And in June 4th, we do have a nice little panel about recruiting, training and engaging ready mix drivers uh, with Andrea Body and uh, a few industry representatives. And that link is gonna be available in the next few weeks. Other than that, there's no more questions. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Bart. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Steve. Uh, great webinar this morning. And we look forward to everybody's participation on either May 5th or May 13th. Thank you and have a great day.
Thanks, everyone.